We have a reading quiz on Thursday, this Thursday, on sound, speech, and hearing. All right. Um, we talked about sound, how it's created by things that, that vibrate. I brought a couple things. I brought some um, tuning forks. I'll send around a couple of tuning forks. Let's see. I'll send the low frequency and the high frequency ones. Uh, so this is a uh, an A note, and this is an E note. In fact, you know, people that tune pianos, they use tuning forks that are similar to this. I'll send them around. You can try them out. Uh, this is our E, and then that's our A. It has a higher frequency. Um, so you can try these out. Yeah, higher frequency. Um, you can just sort of look at these. Notice that you'll feel them vibrate. In fact, y'all might use these sometimes, right? Don't you use these to diagnose knee issues or something? Is that right? Fractures. So it, you just take it and you put it to their their leg or wherever. Am I right in that? I've never done this, but okay. But the vibrations, they what, cause them pain? It hurts a lot. Have you had it done to you before when you've had a hairline fracture? Okay. Well, next time you get a fracture, come to class with it. <laughs> we'll try that out, okay? There you go. Right. You can just feel free to bang them, but not on one another, only with the rubber mallet, please. All right, I have another thing here. This is, I'm not going to pass this around just because it's kind of annoying, but this is, uh, what do they call it? They call it a thunder tube because it, it has a little spring here, and when you bang on the string, then it, it uh, vibrates and causes this column of air to vibrate, and it produces this sound. So you can bang on it pretty loud. It's the thunder tube because it sounds like thunder. But if you want to look at it after class, that's fine. You can take a look, but it's a little distracting for class. So sound waves are created by some object pushing on the air. And it can be a number of different things, right? It can be the, uh, the speaker or a spring, a spring kind of like in the thunder tube, or a tuning fork. Those tuning forks are machined just right so that when you strike them, they vibrate at a particular frequency. They vibrate at 420, whatever, so many oscillations per second. And they literally push on the air and create that sound that you hear. Feel free to bang on the tuning forks, okay, if you want to hear the different sounds and feel the vibrations. Um, a simple wave, and I'll play a simple wave for you soon, it has a single frequency. So these tuning forks, they produce a simple wave. For the most part, they're, they're actually not a, a single frequency, but for the most part, they have a single frequency. Um, and when you when you hit them with your mallet, then they produce that particular frequency. If you were to look at the um, the the graph of this wave, then it would look like what we've been doing. It would have a particular wavelength that would travel through that distance in one period with a certain velocity, a certain frequency. So we can produce sounds with just a single frequency. However, a more common is a complex wave. And it has multiple frequencies added up. So I have a, a tone generator here. You can, if you want to try this on your own, you can do it. It's kind of cool, actually. Um, you can just Google, you know, tone generator, but I have one here that I like. And what this does is it just creates a wave. Uh, 
Let's see. I'm sorry, this one's different. Let me uh Okay, yeah, this is the one I like. So this is an online tone generator. I can give you different frequencies. Sorry, it's kind of loud. Let me turn it down. And I can have either high or low frequencies. I'll go to a lower frequency. Right, that's a little easier on the ears. I can also go to very high frequencies. And later we'll look at the different frequencies and how humans can hear some frequencies but not others. So I can have a single tone like that. I can also have multiple tones. And the multiple tones, let's see, that's 113 hertz. We'll take this down to 135 and 88. And so when I combine these three tones, these are fairly simple. It's just three tones. But actually, when you have a sound like a human voice, you have many hundreds of different frequencies that are interacting with one another. But just listen to this for a moment, and you can hear sort of vibrations or, or modulations within the sound. Do you hear the modulations within the sound? Yeah. Let me show you something. We, your book doesn't go into this, but I think it's fairly interesting. The concept of beats. If you've ever played guitar or piano, how do you tune a guitar? I know. Right, you tighten the strings, but how do you determine if one string is in tune or not? It sounds right. Now, the way you tune a guitar, I'm sorry, what? The way you tune a guitar is usually you, you compare the first string to some known frequency, so a, a tuning fork, like if you're tuning a piano. Or you might have actually an actual tuner, or you might compare it to another guitar that you know is in tune. Then you'll, you'll adjust your first string until that string comes into tune. And then you'll compare your first string with your second string. Now, if you know, you can create the same note with two different strings just by fretting one string and then allowing the other string to be open. So you can play the same note on two different strings. And so you compare those two notes, play both strings at the same time, and see if they sound the same. Uh, but it's kind of difficult to actually discern a frequency to within just a few hertz. So we use this idea of beats. And I'll, I'll demonstrate. Let's see, this is 135. Okay, so these are the two tones. Is that tone okay for y'all? You comfortable? All right. So these are two tones at 135 hertz. But notice what happens if I have one that just goes off a just by one single frequency. Listen. You hear that? When I'm off by one single hertz, I get these things called beats. And these beats will go at one hertz. So one. Two, three, four, five. It has a period of one second. What do you think if I go off by two hertz? Then I get two a second, or three a second, or four a second, or five a second, or six a second. Depending on the difference in the two frequencies, then I will um, I get these beats that will beat at, this, at the same as the difference in frequency. So let's write this. This isn't in your book, but you might see this on the test because um, it is important to sort of how we understand what, uh, what sound does. We have beats. The frequency of the beat is equal to the difference in the two frequencies. And we just take an absolute value. So for example, if I have Two sounds, one is 330 hertz, and one is uh, 328 hertz. And the frequency of the beat will be equal to 2 hertz. That I'll have wah, 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 wah. I'll have two beats per second as I combine those two sounds. So this makes it very easy when you're tuning a piano or a guitar or another stringed instrument to get two strings that are exactly the same frequency. 
the human ear can't really discern those two sounds very well, say between 330 and 328 hertz. But you can certainly discern the beats of these two very similar frequencies, and then you adjust your tension in your string or whatever it is that you do to tune that instrument to make uh, to make the the beats be equal to zero, so they have exactly the same frequency. All right. So that's what piano tuners do. If you've ever seen a piano tuner, they have a tuning fork. If you notice on this, this is the F note. They would take the tuning fork and they go, dun, dun, and then they play the F key, and then they adjust the string on the F key until they no longer hear beats when those two waves combine. All right, uh, let's look at detection of sound. Later we'll look at the ear and how the ear works, but right now we're just going to look at speakers. Uh, detection of sound involves the... Y'all done? Awesome. Thanks, Raj. Uh, it involves the... I don't know what I was supposed to put there. I'm sorry. I'm just going to leave that off. The tech involves the... Uh I don't know. Do you all know? I'm sorry. These are new notes, and sometimes they're not in my notes. So, uh, But a device measures the frequency and amplitude... of the, the pressure variations in a medium. And we basically have two different ways to measure sound. We have a microphone. Microphone. And the ear are really two ways that we'll consider how we measure sound or detect sound. And both consist of a diaphragm. This is just some material that's stretched taut over a surface that if, if a pressure wave impinges upon it, it vibrates in response. Right In the ear, that's our eardrum, right? our tympanic membrane. Uh, in a microphone, it's, a, well, it's basically a speaker. It's a paper cone that when you speak or when it detects sound, it vibrates in response to that. So both consist of a diaphragm that vibrates when sound strikes it. Remember I showed you that video where it showed the speaker, the Khan Academy video, and as the speaker vibrates back and forth, then it pushes pressure waves throughout the medium. It's basically the reverse of that. In fact, a microphone and a speaker are exactly the same. It's just sort of their size and how they're tuned to, to get particular frequencies. And it's, you know, what order does it operate? Does it detect sound or does it produce sound? But you can use a microphone to produce sound. It wouldn't be very good because your detectors are pretty small and they just, they don't, they're not designed to make sound. But in theory, you could use a microphone to actually produce sound. So a microphone and a speaker are very similar. Both can be used as either, as I said, not as well as, as it's designed for. So a microphone is designed differently than a speaker. All right, let's look at human production and detection of sound. There's a, a little section in your book on this. Humans can only detect sound in the sonic region of the spectrum. When I say the spectrum, there's a frequency spectrum that sound can go all the way from zero hertz, basically up to an infinite hertz. Uh, but there's a particular region of the spectrum that, that we can hear. 
Uh, you'll need to know what those are. These are, they range from 20 to 20,000 hertz. The infrasonic is below the audible level, that is below 20 hertz, and the ultrasonic is above the audible level. We don't use infrasonic sounds very often, uh, probably not really at all, but you know, think of like whales that communicate. These infrasonic sounds, they can travel for very large distances, but sometimes we can hear those sounds. You know, you've heard the whales and how they speak to one another, but a lot of the sounds that they produce, we just can't, we can't hear. The reason they can produce such low frequency sounds is because they're big, right? We talked about how a tuba makes a lower frequency than, say, a piccolo. Similar for whales. Whales are huge, right? And they just have these huge uh, vocal cavities that can produce these very low frequency sounds. Let's try this. Some of you might not like this, and I'll, I'll try not to do it too annoying. But let's go back to our frequency generator, and we're going to practice this 20 hertz versus 20,000 hertz uh, and see what you can hear. Now, your, your range of audible spectrum, that is what you can hear, changes as you get older. So uh, right now, you might be able to hear at 20 hertz or 50 hertz or 80 hertz, but as you get older, then you, you won't be able to hear that well. Or as you have ear damage, hearing damage, um, then you, you can't. Not only does it affect the volume of the sound that you can hear, but it also affects the frequency of the sound that you can hear. In fact, some people, as we'll see later when we talk about the ear, it's not that they can't hear uh, low volumes. It's just, it's just that they can't hear particular frequencies because they have damage within their, um, what's it called, the, the hair cells in their, in their ear. We'll talk about that more later. Let's see. Y'all can hear that, I assume? Hear that okay? That's 83 hertz. You hear that? Let me turn it up a little bit. I can sort of sense the presence of it there. Like I, I got, you, know, you can sense it, but there's, let me stop it. Yeah, okay, a little bit. Let's go a little bit lower. You can still hear it, Daisy? Yeah. Now at 20 hertz, our speakers are diff they're just not really designed to produce a 20 hertz sound. So it might be that you actually can hear down to 20 hertz, just the speaker isn't creating it. You know, hear 35, or at least sense it. Yeah, let me take it away. Usually you can. You know, ready? It's gonna go away. Yeah. Yeah. So. Probably be on that. I'll go down to 20, see if you can hear it. Most people can't. That's 20 hertz, right? Mm -hmm. All right. It's, it's the high frequency that's hard. I'm just going to turn it down. This is 60. So everybody should be able to hear this. Hopefully, it won't be too loud. Oh, all right. So that's 6,000 hertz. Let's go on up to 10,000. Right, everybody heard that? Okay. Let's see. Let's go up to 15. I think we. Oh, y'all can hear that? Okay. I can't hear that at all. Drew, Dre, can you hear it? Okay. Because our speak it's mainly because our speakers are, are better at producing high sounds than low sounds. So if we had better speakers like big woofers, you might be able to hear the twenty hertz sound. That's above twenty thousand. Uh, let's go up to seventeen. It's very quiet, but y'all can hear it? Okay. 
All right, this is above the 20,000. Somebody might be able to hear this, but let's try it. Can I hear that? Let me turn it up a little bit. Okay. All right. So it's a fun thing. You can try it with your friends. Show them beats or show them the different frequencies. It's a fun party game. If y'all go to parties, I'm not sure if you do. But <laughs> to see who has the better hearing. I play in a band, so my hearing is shot anyway. But uh, many of you have pretty good hearing. All right. Let's um, dogs and cats can hear the ultrasonic. That's above that twenty thousand hertz, and other animals are known to are known to communicate by infrasonic waves. which can travel very long distances. You know, whales, for example. Other animals do this too. No, it's different from echolocation, uh, but we'll talk about that later. No, but whales communicate by these very low frequency waves. Uh, kind of like that, <laughs> except a lot lower and louder too. Um, Ultrasound equipment, which many of you will use, or some of you will use, uses about 20 million hertz. So a thousand times higher frequency than the end of the audible spectrum. And these uh, vibrations or waves are absorbed quickly. So it's sort of like the opposite of our infrasonic, which travel very long distances. These are absorbed very quickly. And that sort of is like echolocation. It, it is echolocation, basically, that the ultrasonic waves, they travel in, and then they bounce back, and it measures that travel time for the waves. But many of you probably know more about that than I do. All right, let's try some of these clicker questions. We'll try this first one up here on the left. A vibrating string produces a sound of a certain pitch. What happens to the pitch if the mass of the string is increased? Or the mass density. We can think of it as in terms of mass density. What happens to the pitch if the mass of the string is increased? Uh, I'll be right back, OK? All right, uh, let's stop in just a few seconds, 110. We're having a party in here? Well, did I walk in on a party? Uh, <laughs> oh, shoot. Uh, okay, good. It decreases. Uh, so like on a guitar, the fatter strings are have a lower pitch than the higher pitch strings. You can do that with rubber bands, too. It's sort of difficult because you have to get the right tension in them. Like, you need two rubber bands that are different masses but have the same tension. Listen. Oh, y'all can't hear that. I'll pass them around. You can try it. You sort of set up, like, two little guitars, and you can hear the different pitches. Have a really low pitch on the, uh, the fat rubber band and a higher pitch. I'll just walk around and do it. Hear the difference in the pitches? Can y'all hear that back here, Lydia? There's a difference in the pitch. I have a low pitch for the massive rubber band, and then a higher pitch for the uh, the less massive rubber band. I'll pass this around in a few minutes. I want to talk about something else. Hear that, Trey? 
<laughs> okay, so it does, the frequency will decrease. All right, the speed of the wave depends on which of these. Frequency, wavelength, or the medium, or some combination thereof. All right, let's stop at uh, 45, 45. Should I go up at C? Hey, that's right. Good. Um, often students get confused about this because we see this expression, V is equal to F times lambda. And we say, well, gosh, if we increase our frequency, that must mean that the speed increases. But that's not true. Our speed is always constant. It's only dependent upon the medium. And in fact, if I increase my frequency, then the wavelength decreases. I'm sort of mixing up my pictures of waves, but you can think about this, that if I increase my frequency, I go from a wave that looks like that to a wave that looks like that. And now I can think, I've increased my frequency. It's oscillating at a more frequent rate, but I've also decreased my wavelength. That the wavelength will respond to a change in frequency, not the speed of the wave. The speed of the wave is constant. I told y'all that I used to work at a, like I was a bartender for some time in college. I told y'all this. Is that right? Yeah, so. Um, we had this policy at Harvey's, this restaurant where I worked, that we didn't allow certain types of folks in our bar. And so one time this guy comes in, and he was a mushroom. And we had this sign on the thing that said, look, no mushrooms allowed. And the guy looked at me, and he says, hey, I'm a fun guy. Uh, all right. So let's try this one. The lowest pitch a person can hear is what? All right, let's stop at uh, 23. Okay, awesome. 20 to 20,000 hertz. Just sort of know those numbers. And then finally, true or false, microphones and speakers work by the same mechanism. Is that A, true statement, or B, a false statement? All right, just a couple more seconds. 25. All right, looks like that's everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, some animals can hear below the 20 hertz. I think that some humans probably can, so it, it's not a hard limit. But uh, it's just that the size of the, the diaphragm in your ear, the tympanic membrane or the eardrum, is not really equipped to, to hear that sound. But the human ear can hear a wide range of frequencies, right? 20 to 20,000 hertz, that's a very wide range of frequencies. So some humans might be able to hear below that slightly, but for the most part, no. All right, let's see. A is right. Microphones and speakers, they're exactly the same. It's just really the order in which they operate. Are they receiving pressure variations? Or are they producing pressure variations? Let's see. What type of clothes do lawyers wear? What type of clothes do lawyers wear? Lawsuits. Uh, okay. Um, let's look at the anatomy and physiology of speech production. Speech is caused by the movement of air past the vocal cords.
The air is forced past the vocal cords. Because of the uh, the diaphragm, right? Remember we talked about how the lungs are not really muscles, but you have the diaphragm that can change the shape of your cavity. And when it makes the cavity smaller, it forces that air past the vocal cords. So you can force them at different velocities. Uh, and when that happens, uh, the diaphragm can enlarge or shorten the chest cavity. People generally breathe 12 to 15 times per second when they're in normal activity, and air will move from the uh, from the lungs through the trachea. You need to know the basic parts of this. You need to know the lungs, the diaphragm, the trachea, the larynx, the vocal cords. Um, this is also called the windpipe sometimes. And then to the larynx, which has the vocal cords. And this is sometimes called the uh, Adam's apple. So this little thing in your throat, that's the, the protective covering around your vocal cords. In fact, you know, if you sort of feel of that and you you can feel it vibrating when you hum or when you speak or whatever. Um, so your vocal cords are inside the Adam's apple or inside that larynx. The vocal cords are they're sometimes called the vocal folds are inside the larynx which protects and moves them with cartilage and muscles. So the cords are actually muscles. I'll show you a video of them in just a second. These muscles can, uh, can open or close, abduct or adduct. Oh, I always get those mixed up. Open is abducted and closed is adducted. Am I right about that? Y'all should know this. That's right. Okay, so that can open or close depending on the situation. And the space between the cords is called the uh, called the glottis. We'll look at a thing called the glottal stop. And that's when you actually close that space, the glottis. Let's watch a little video I have here. When you're whispering, it's open. When you're breathing, these are open. And uh, when you're speaking, they can sort of open and close as you as you make different sounds. A glottal stop is when you close the glottis. And this causes a particular sound. I have a singing video. I don't know if any of y'all sing, but uh, this is a, a lady that instructs people how to sing. I think she's an opera singer. But in this short video, she's talking about the glottal stop, which is a particular, we use a glottal stop when we speak, but singers, especially pop singers, use the glottal stop to produce this particular sound. So we'll watch this. Uh, actually, I have a challenge for you is that as you're sitting with your friends at lunch today, that you try to speak the entire time, or next time you see somebody, you try to speak the entire time without using any glottal stops. Try it out. I think these would probably just sound like hippies or whatever. Hey, <laughs> But wi when you're whispering, you don't use glottal stops. That glottis stays open when you whisper, so you can just whisper. frequency, we've seen this equation already, but the frequency of the sound is given by this equation, where we talked about that it's dependent upon the length of the string, 
It's dependent upon the tension in the string, and it's also dependent upon the mass density. L is length, longer strings, lower frequency. Um, that is, if L increases, F decreases. The tension in the string, T, if T goes up, F goes up. And I'll pass around the rubber bands you can practice that. Where if I have a rubber band that has very little tension, it has a low frequency. But then if I stretch it out more, it has a higher frequency. I'll pass this around in a sec. And then also the mass density, mu. You can think of it as mass if that makes you feel better. But it's really mass density. That is how much mass per unit length. And if mu goes up, that's the Greek letter mu, then um, that if you have a more massive string, then the frequency decreases. Let's see, I have two rubber bands I'll pass around, and you can try both. You can look at two different things. One is the mass density, so look at the little rubber band and the big rubber band. High frequency, low frequency. And then you can take the big rubber band and make different tensions, and you can hear the different frequencies of sound. I only have one of the little rubber bands, but I have a bunch of these, so I'll pass around these. No popping people with these things, okay? Sorry, I just got to melt myself. I got it. Okay, so a greater tension will give a higher frequency. And the length of the vocal cords also affects the frequency. Now, when we're talking, how do we make different frequencies of sound? Do we change L, do we change T, or do we change mu? When we're speaking and making different pitches, high, low, high, low, that sort of thing, how do we make those different sounds? Which of these three variables are we changing? The T, right, because you can't change the mass density of your, uh, your vocal cords. You also can't change the length of them. They are what they are, and they don't change length or mass density. However, men, you know, tend to have larger... Uh, Larger larynxes have a larger larynx and longer vocal cords. And so that's one of the primary reasons why they just tend to have lower voices than women. There are other things that are physical that come into play, but physically that, that's one of the primary reasons is just the length of those vocal cords. They just tend to have bigger larynxes and longer vocal cords, so they have a lower pitch voice. Um, when you speak, though, you're actually changing the tension. The amplitude of the sound is governed by the amount of air that flows past the cord. All right, so let me... Uh, I'll write this down, but let me, so don't write this down right now, but let me just explain to you the Bernoulli effect. Um, have we talked about the Bernoulli effect yet? I think that we might have in short when we did fluids, but I think I told y'all that it wasn't. I'm going to test you on it, but here we will see the Bernoulli effect because it is important in how the vocal cords operate that the Bernoulli effect actually will cause them to come apart and go, come, come together and go apart. The Bernoulli effect is sort of the same idea behind an airplane wing. So in an airplane wing, I have air that comes on the airplane wing. One of them travels over the wing, and one of the air streams travels below the wing. And because the wing is created, built the way that it is, the one on top travels a larger distance, and so it has a higher velocity. And what the Bernoulli effect says is that if I have a high velocity fluid flow, then I have a low pressure. And down here, then, I have a high pressure. 
So if I have a high velocity on the top, that means I have a lower pressure. That's what the Bernoulli principle says. If you increase your velocity, you decrease the pressure. And so on an aircraft wing, if you have a high pressure and a low pressure, you're going to have a net force pointing up. That's a lift, right? causes your airplane to go up into the sky. But it's due to the Bernoulli effect. You can see the Bernoulli effect in a lot of different other ways. Uh, let's see. Oh, here we go. So this is a, it's a votive candle glass, and there's a little ping pong ball. Watch this. This is pretty cool. This comes, by the way, in uh, when you're doing like uh, respiratory treatments, when you have breathing treatments, and you, you have a, your patient breathe through an apparatus, and it actually entrains the medicine up into their, their breathing. You'll see what, like air flows over this bottle of medicine, and it sucks up the liquid into the stream of airflow. So this is a similar thing, that if I blow a high velocity stream of air across this glass, high velocity means what type of pressure? High or low pressure? Low pressure. So if I blow a stream of air across this glass, it will create a low pressure region atop the ping pong ball. Now, inside the glass is still a high pressure region, but in the glass, on top of the glass, I have a low pressure region. So watch. You'll see. Now, it's not that the air is going in and scooping the ball out. Like I'm just blowing air across the top, creates a low pressure on top. And then the high pressure air inside the glass is what pushes the ball up. I'm sorry. I got it. No, that's not your fault. That's, it is your fault. I blame you. Uh, you might have seen this before, too. This is a similar thing. It's a little bit different, but it's similar. This is a special Bernoulli device that I bought on this science clearinghouse thing. So it's a hair dryer. Did y'all see that? But if I have a hair dryer, I have this high velocity air coming out of the hair dryer. Is the area where the air is, is that high or low pressure? The high velocity air. High or low pressure? High. Low pressure. So when you're drying your hair, that's a low pressure because it has a high velocity. Um, I know it feels like it's high pressure because it's pushing on your head, but by the Bernoulli effect, if I have a high speed or a high velocity, then I have low pressure. And so I have a low pressure region on the inside where the air is, and then I have high pressure regions pushing in and out. So watch, I can take my ping pong ball. So it's sort of entrained in this, this low pressure column with these high pressure pushing either side. Sometimes you can even sort of make it go off to the side. Oops. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you have air pushing them up. Yeah, it's a similar thing. You have air pushing the guys, guys or women up, but they're sort of, they're forced into the middle in a similar way as the ping pong ball. I've never done one of those, but yeah, I imagine that's how it works. All right, um, and then one other thing, and this is really more appropriate for our vocal folds. You ever been on the road, and you've come up next to, or you've driven past a, like an 18-wheeler? What happens, do y'all know? It like sucks you into it, right? Yeah, so that's because of the Bernoulli principle, too. Have I done this with the two sheets of paper? Oh, I have done this, okay. Can I show you again because it's really cool? Your vocal folds do a similar thing, that when you have high velocity air pushing between them, then they come together. So imagine these are your vocal cords, and you know I'm your diaphragm, I'm pushing air down through these vocal folds. It will actually force them to come together. So mainly it's the muscles are actually pulling them apart, and it's the airflow that pushes them together. But it's a combination of the two. All right, so let's put this in words. So muscles will bring the cords together. And then air flowing pushes them apart. 
pushes the cords apart. That's sort of as we would expect. But then, uh, low pressure due to the Bernoulli effect. causes them to come back together again. So the muscles will, will force them together, and then you blow air through them, forcing them apart. And then, by the same way with the paper, the low pressure will cause them to come back together again. This low pressure oscillates, causing the vibration. All right. Uh, the sound produced by the vocal cords is also changed in a very complex way by the mouth, the throat, and the nose. Are there any singers? Any of y'all sing? No. But if you sing, you know that it makes a big deal how your mouth is positioned. You have your mouth open and or if you have a cold, it changes the way that you, your voice sounds. Uh, so that all affects the way that you you speak and the sounds that you make with your with your vocal cords. So just know that that occurs. We're not going to look at the complex ways that that occurs. All right, let's look at hearing. You will need to know the ear and the different parts of the ear, kind of like we had with the heart and with the eye, like we had before. You'll just need to know the the basic parts of the ear and what they do. So at a basic level, it detects vibration. And the ear has three parts, the external ear, or outer, the middle ear, or the tympanic sometimes called the tympanic um, cavity. You know those big kettle drums that they use in uh, concert bands, those big brass drums, they're like this wide, and they look like big bowls. Do you know what those are called? Tympanies, right? They're called tympanies. In a similar way, we can think of the tympanic cavity, like this is the membrane over the big drum, and then uh, sort of the middle ear in in uh, encloses that entire cavity. And then you have the inner ear, or the internal ear. The outer ear includes the auricle. This is sometimes called the pinna. And the auditory canal. All right, so the oracle is this part right here. It's that funky looking flap of skin that you have on the side of your head, cartilage. And then this is the auditory canal. Now, you, you should not put anything smaller than what into your ear. You ever heard this adage or rule? Anything smaller than, no, not your finger elbow. They say you should never put anything smaller than your elbow into your ear. Not your finger, not a key, not a Q-tip. I mean, I know that I like Q-tips too, but because uh, what that does is that can take earwax and cram it down into your ear. It can become very painful or it can cause infections or at the worst case it can cause, uh, you know, hearing damage because it can affect the eardrum. So nothing bigger than your elbow. I mean, you can't fit your elbow into your ear, but you can get your friend to put their elbow in your ear if you like. But nothing bigger than their elbow. Um, the oracle, it's the visible part of the ear. And it directs sound waves to the ear. of a particular frequency
In fact, the oracle designed such that it picks up those frequencies that we need to hear, that it, it actually responds to that 20 to 20,000 hertz. And that's part of the reason that we have that, that audible range, because the oracle is shaped in such a way that it takes those frequencies of sound and funnels them down into our auditory canal. Now, our ear canal, our auditory canal, well, it's about one inch long. It's open at the oracle and closed at the eardrum. Or the tympanic membrane, if you want to call it that. You might see, uh, I, I probably won't call the oracle the pinna, but you could see auditory canal or the ear canal, or you could see tympanic membrane or the eardrum. Uh, so you need to know sort of those different names. And it acts to amplify the sound. All right. The ear canal acts to amplify these waves. These pressure waves enter into the oracle. They're funneled down into the ear canal. And then in the ear canal, that little inch or so of space, it actually amplifies that sound before it goes onto the eardrum. The middle ear includes the eardrum and the three bones. These are called the uh, auditory ossicles. Smallest bones in the body, right? There's three bones. Isn't that right? I've had anatomy, right? I studied the ear in anatomy. Yeah, I think they are the smallest bones in the body. So you have the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. These act as a sort of lever. Remember we talked about class one, two, and three levers? These act as a lever. And what did levers do when we talked about levers? Or what was one thing that they could do? They could take a force and what, make it bigger or smaller? Well, it could go either way, actually. Yeah, you can use a lever to make a force bigger or smaller. But the, uh, the auditory ossicles take the force of the eardrum vibrating, and it takes that force and makes it bigger. So they're basically just a fancy kind of lever that's inside of your ear. Um, so let's see. Let's write this on the side. The auditory ossicles act as a lever. to increase the force. Uh, the middle ear also has the opening to the um, to the pharynx. Called the eustachian tube. It should be capitalized, actually, or capital E, to the eustachian tube. So let's see. I think there's a picture of this up here. Yeah, here it is. This is. is. I'll go back to that in just a second. But this is called the eustachian tube. Um, many of you might have had tubes put in your ears, or you had a lot of ear infections when you were children, or maybe you know children that had a lot of ear infections. The reason is, is because kids... One, they just sort of, they're snotty a lot. And so they get a lot of fluid built up behind their eardrum. Because, you know, this is sort of all connected in with your sinuses and with your breathing. Uh, this goes down into into your pharynx. Uh, gosh, where is your pharynx? It's not the same as your larynx. It's sort of up, I think. Y'all know? I don't remember. But it's connected to your, your windpipe. But um, And so little kids, this tube can be really small. And it can just get clogged up really easily. So when they actually come in and put tubes in, that's the reason. It's because this eustachian tube is clogged up, and they'll put tubes in to relieve that pressure. I think, do they put them in the eardrum, or do they put them inside behind the eardrum? Eh, I don't know. Right. That's why if you're sick, that you're, uh, it, it feels like you have pressure behind your ears. Because this eustachian tube gets inflamed, or it just gets clogged up with a bunch of gunk. And then your fluid can't drain from behind the eardrum. And it just feels like you can't hear anything because you have all this fluid pushing out on the eardrum and it just can't accept those vibrations that are coming into your ears.
Right, so that's the eustachian tube. Uh, this is the eardrum or the tympanic membrane. These bones right here, uh, they're sort of right here. These are the ossicles. You'll need to be able to identify all of these for the test coming up, I guess, in a week or two. Uh, is it? Gosh, when is the test? Does anybody know? 28. Okay, so we still have a couple of weeks. There's the ossicles. You'll need to know those and what they do. Uh, the eustachian tube is used to equalize pressure with the atmosphere. And these can get blocked with um, mucus or inflammation. The eardrum is also called the tympanic membrane. Right, here's another picture of the tympanic membrane. This is just sort of blown up. Here we see those those three bones, your ossicles, and then here's the eustachian tube. They call it the auditory tube right there. Uh, it vibrates when sound impinges upon it. All right, so that takes us into our our outer and our middle ear. Remember, our outer ear is the floppy part on the outside along with the auditory canal. And then we pick up with the middle ear, which includes the eardrum and these auditory ossicles. This whole little cavity right here is the tympanic cavity. You go back to that in case y'all missed. We had uh, those auditory ossicles, these three bones, uh, they act as a sort of lever. They're attached to the tympanic membrane. When it vibrates, it transfers the force of those vibrations to the auditory ossicles, and then they go over into the inner ear. They transfer that force into the inner ear. All right, can I go down from here? All right. Uh, the auditory ossicles are three small bones. You need to know the name. Uh, you don't have to write them out, but you need to know the name of them. The malleus, like you can see it in a multiple choice question. The malleus. This is a hammer whose handle is connected to the eardrum. I call it a hammer because, you know, like a mallet, if that helps you to remember. It's the one that's actually connected to the eardrum. Um, the incus looks like an anvil. And then the third is the stapes, which looks like a stirrup. Like on a on a saddle, you would put your feet into. So the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And remember again, know the purpose of these three all together, that they transfer forces from the eardrum into the inner ear, which we'll talk about. The um, the ossicles transfer vibrations. the eardrum to the inner ear. And the pressure of these vibrations is multiplied by about 20. So remember this acts like a like a lever of sorts. And if I have a lever such that the lever arms are different, if I put a, a small force in here, I get a big force here. And that's what your ossicles are doing. They're taking those very small vibrations on your tympanic membrane on your uh, eardrum, and they're vi multiplying them by about a factor of 20. All right, and then finally the inner ear, just a few more minutes. Um, the inner ear consists of the cochlea, the vestibule, and the semicircular canals. The cochlea is a fu fluid-filled chamber. that receives uh, pressure waves for different pitch sounds.
Right, so remember we had the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. The stapes is actually attached to the inner ear. Uh, that's what was it called? I forget. There's like a, a little window that it's attached to. It was on one of your figures. Oh, shoot. Yeah, the oval window. So your stapes right here, remember it looks like a stirrup. Uh, it actually transfers those forces into the inner ear with the cochlea. The waves cause the the basilar membrane to vibrate. In that figure, it was called the oval window. But your book calls it the ambassador membrane, so please, I want you to know, know this term. To vibrate in different ways depending on the sound. And then fibers in the basilar membrane uh, stimulate hair cells, which are connected to the auditory nerve of the brain. I have a video to sort of show you this process. But in short, you get these. The, the vibrations on your tympanic membrane, on your eardrum, they are transferred to this fluid-filled chamber in the cochlea. And so these vibration waves will pass through this fluid, and they'll stimulate particular cells depending on the frequency. And then that information is sent to your brain, which it interprets as a sound. Let's see. Let's watch this. Uh, yeah, we'll just sort of stop with this. So 